Here's a few news links I thought were interesting. Um, this one's kind of fun. Uh, somebody had a malware sample, and when you look at the strings in the malware, you find insults, which uh, you often see messages like this. Um, not always this angry. Anyway, um, it's part of malware analysis. Uh, you'll find a lot of stuff like that in the Windows source code, too. Angry, screaming, profane insults at other divisions of Microsoft that made the uh, developer's job more difficult. So this one I mentioned, I think, in a previous class, but it's particularly relevant to this class here, the web application class. Uh, this police cyber alarm is some kind of security product people put at colleges and government agencies. And this guy does white hatting, Paul Moore, something I used to do, where you do a tests of products without permission and then try to tell people, and usually you just get punched in the face for it, which is all he gets. So he found a bunch of vulnerabilities in this thing 18 months ago and told them, and they just gave him the runaround and didn't fix it. And somebody asked him to test it again, and he found, again, appalling errors. And these are very much the kind of errors that we're covering in this class. So he found that the passwords could be chosen unwisely. Um, unsalted SHA-256. But what's even much worse than that is something I found in a, another app a while ago. The API is unprotected. So you can send a request to the server, and the reply sends the password back to you. And you can just ask for other people's passwords, and it will just tell you. So you can just get other people's passwords right from the API. This is the kind of mistake is quite common in API. Um, at web properties, there's frequently insecure direct object reference, where you can go directly to some page that is supposed to require privileges, like admin privileges, and they forget to check. So if you can find the page, you can use it even without admin permissions. And the same thing is often true of APIs. So you're able to use this API that returns the password, and it doesn't check to see if you're really logged in as that user or not. Um, then he found um, insecure session tokens, uh, where it's just uh, the session token is just created from the time plus a random number that's only four digits long, so you only have to try 10,000 guesses to guess it if you know what time it is. And so on the average, after 4,500 requests, you can get in, and he demonstrated that that's um, absolutely uh, doable. Sure, take a look at this. This is very standard, like uh, Web 101 security vulnerabilities. This is just the kind of stuff you'll do in the Web Security Academy. Each one of these things is just a bug standard, low-level vulnerability. And you find them all the time if you do these web app tests. Um, here's, the again, the unauthenticated API. You can just make a request. It'll just hand over you the records for anybody. Um, no cross-site request forgery protection. Like we said, you can just replay um, a request without it coming from the right place. Um, the password validation routine is not timing safe, which means it takes a different amount of time if the password is wrong than if the password is right. So that means you can just brute force passwords and keep track of the time in order to find out. Um, apparently, I didn't know this, PHP has a function called hash equals, which is a timing safe routine. That's news to me. Anyway, uh, then he found they used AES CBC to encrypt some data, and they used it unwisely, so you can man in the middle it, and then you can just do something we were doing last semester in the crypto class. You can flip single bits of AES CBC. This is, um, I forget the name of this attack, but it's a known attack. You can forge AES CBC without knowledge of the key. It's vulnerable to that. Um, all right. And, uh, all right. And uh, that's it. Well, anyway. Good, clean, fun. And he talks about his uh, his attempts to get these guys to patch it, and they just sort of lied and said there's no problem, and then asked for forever, and then jerked him around until he finally just dumped it publicly to shame them into fixing it, which is what you end up doing when you're a white hat. There's not a lot of reward for white hatting. I've done plenty of it. Haven't done that much lately. But anyway, it makes good blog posts. <laughs> All right. And uh, here's another one. This is why... Um, Another one of my students joined Twitter recently, and I don't know if I've reminded you, you should all join Twitter if you're in the security business, because it's where the security community hangs out, where you learn things like this, for example. There's apparently a flaw in curl. 
the command line Linux utility that's been around for 20 years, and they still haven't announced it. They've reserved a CVE for it, so apparently it's going to be announced pretty soon. So you get this kind of information. Um, so anyway, presumably we'll be hearing more about that soon. And uh, the Pentagon is going to power far-flung braces with nuclear microreactors in like little containers. Um, this is uh, the latest hotness. Uh, some people are, of course, nervous about this. <laughs> what about the waste? What if you can take it and repurpose it for other purposes? But anyway, they're going to do it. The address of that crypto blog is uh, on the page there. Let me pre-post it. It's here. There you go. Good. All right. Yeah, that's a fun one. Very relevant to this class. And this one I was sort of amazed at. Biden's going to have more sanctions. What's he going to do now? What he's going to do is sanction Russian cryptocurrency miners. Now, I, th I, uh, that sounds completely impossible and insane to me. I don't know if they have some brilliant plan I haven't thought of or if somebody uh, told Biden this who does not understand cryptocurrency, but it seems to me like you can't possibly do that. <laughs> if they have Bitcoin miners in Russia and they mine a block, how is the U.S. going to do anything about that? <laughs> anyway, um, I'll be interested to see if something actually comes of that. <laughs> And here's a good article from Joseph Marks talking about uh, zero days. You know, people are afraid of zero days. These are vulnerabilities that have not been reported, that the, the developer doesn't know about, that your antivirus vendor doesn't know about, and there is no patch and there's no mitigation. So there's really nothing you can do about it. And a lot of people, apparently, they find zero days are so easy to find. People are using them. They're cheap to find more. And they say almost all the zero days that they became aware of are extremely simple attacks, the kind like in, we're making in the 127 class. They say the only company that actually makes complex, difficult zero days is the NSGO group, the famous Russian, I mean, or Israeli group that is based on people from the Israeli military working privately, and they're known for very high technology exploits, and the company is being pretty much destroyed by U.S. sanctions now. Um, but the... Um, as they say, it turns out most of the time you do not need to do anything super difficult to make a zero day. Just need to apply these standard techniques and you'll find a bunch of stuff. A bunch of products have holes in it that haven't been patched. So, you know, we're, uh, we're in the early days of security and people have not really learned to audit for the low-hanging fruit as much as they should. All right. Well, that's enough news.